The satanic Jews that control everything and mostly everybody. You are not the chosen of God. You are the chosen of Satan. I'm talking about the wicked ones in the Jewish community that run America, run the government, run the world, own the banks own the means of communication. They are my enemies. Good evening, friends. I'm Atina Grossman. I'm a professor of history in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences here at the Cooper Union. And I'm really very delighted to welcome you all tonight to what promises to be a very stimulating and provocative evening of discussion and some lively exchange among our speakers, taking us from a pogrom in the city of Kishinev in Russia in 19, April 1903 to some of the most disturbing aspects of our current political situation here in the US. An event, in other words, very much in the tradition of the Great Hall in which we are gathered this evening. Indeed, nearly 110 years ago, on September 12, 1908, Anna Strunsky, a Russian-born American Jewish socialist, stood on this stage in the midst of New York's immigrant Lower East Side, a forum for so many radical activists, especially in the turbulent years 1900 to 1917, and reported to a large gathering on her and her husband, William English Walling's eyewitness accounts of their experiences in Russia, making the connections with so many historical and political consequences that we will hear about tonight between the murderous persecution of Jews in Russia, Kishinev being only one very widely publicized example, and anti-black lynchings and riots in the US including just recently in the North, in Springfield, Illinois, the birthplace, as you know, of Abraham Lincoln, another speaker, as you just heard, who famously appeared in this venerable hall. From that meeting in fall 1908 would emerge another meeting at the Walling Strunsky's New York home on January 9th, 1909, which led, as you will also hear tonight, to the formation in 1910 of the NAACP. And that meeting, in turn, here, was part of a long line of events in the Great Hall, calling for social and economic justice. Notably, we should add, another one, just two months after Strunsky's appearance, giving voice to another young Jewish immigrant woman, whom many of you will know, garment worker Clara Lemlish, who with her passionate call in Yiddish, defying her own union leaders, cried out, I have no further patience for talk, and inspired what we know as the uprising of the 20,000, a sort of general strike of female, immigrant, mostly Jewish or Italian, sweatshop workers who proceeded to launch, right from this hall, militant strikes for decent pay, safe working conditions, and human dignity. Not enough to prevent the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire of 1911, but certainly part of the tradition of this hall in which we are gathered, of passionate civic debate and engagement, which we seek to continue here tonight and at our other events. So I'm very, very happy to see all of you here. And I'm particularly excited uh, to welcome someone who is joining us this evening, I believe, uh, Christopher English Walling, the grandson of Anna Stransky, the descendant of a notable line of activists, 
public servants, philanthropists, and a highly distinguished jewelry designer and expert on pearls. Are you here? Hello, welcome. Welcome to the Great Hall. And now, finally, it's really my pleasure uh, to introduce tonight's moderator, Barry Weiss. Uh, Barry is a writer and editor at the New York Times op-ed page. Uh, before joining the Times, she was the op -ed, an op-ed editor, editor at the Wall Street Journal and an associate book review editor there. And for two years, many of us knew her as a senior editor at Tablet, the online magazine of Jewish news, politics, and culture, where she worked on the site's political and news coverage. She's written for Haaretz, for The Forward, The Late New York Sun, and regularly appears on shows like Morning Joe and Bill Mayer, where she talks politics and culture, which I think is what we're going to do tonight. So I will hand it over to Barry, who will introduce the rest of the Thank you all for coming. There's a striking passage in Joachim's best memoir of his Berlin childhood, a book called Not I, in which he recalls his father, who was a sincere Catholic and an adamant anti-Nazi, remembering how he begged his Jewish friends to leave Germany in the 1930s. Fest's father praised these Jewish friends to the highest. He said of them in their self-discipline, their quiet civility, and their unsentimental brilliance, they had really been the last of the Prussians. They had only one failing, he said, which had become their undoing. They were over, being overwhelmingly governed by their heads. They had, in tolerant Prussia, lost their instinct for danger. It's fair to say that until quite recently, a similar comment could have been made about American Jews, not just in terms of what we have contributed to civic life in politics, the arts, and sciences, but also of having grown so accustomed to American tolerance that we too have lost our own instinct for danger. If that complacency didn't end during the 2016 campaign, it most certainly ended for many American Jews in August of last year, when white supremacists bearing tiki torches and shouting, the Jews will not replace us, marched through the streets of Charlottesville. And the President of the United States could not bring himself to utter a sincere, an unequivocal, unequivocal condemnation of these American Nazis. How could this happen? Didn't the president have a Jewish daughter and an influential son-in-law in the White House? Hadn't he surrounded himself with powerful Jewish advisors? Could it really be that the Republican Party, which had become the pro-Israel party in recent years, could endorse a president who throughout the campaign had made use of his supporters on the so-called alt-right? Meantime, while we have been dwelling on the resurgence of anti-Semitism on the right here at home, Jews across the pond have been focused on its return in only slightly veiled political form on the political left. Today, one of the most pressing political topics in London, certainly among its Jews, is the extent to which the Labour Party has been infected, or maybe infested, with anti-Semitism under the radical leadership of Jeremy Corbyn. In a sense, this shouldn't surprise us. We know from historical experience that anti-Semitism is a shape-shifting phenomenon that adapts itself to trends of the day. So now is the moment for those of us here, Jewish and not, to regain what Fest's father called the instinct for danger. It's time for us to prick up our ears and to open our eyes and talk frankly about this world's oldest hatred before it gains any greater force on either edge of the political spectrum. To do that, I am thrilled to welcome two brilliant writers who I know can help us discuss this issue with bravery and depth. Let's start with a historian who schlepped here from Berkeley, California. Stephen J. Zipperstein is a professor of history and Jewish culture at Stanford University. He's also a literary critic and the author of eight books, including The Jews of Odessa, A Cultural History, An Elusive Prophet, Echad Am, and The Origins of Zionism. His work has been translated into Russian, Hebrew, and French. His latest book is called Pogrom, Kishnev and the Tilt of History. It was called a masterpiece yesterday by the Los Angeles Review of Books 
and was praised by the Rebbe himself, Philip Roth. Please join me in welcoming Steve. Jonathan Weissman is the deputy Washington editor of a little local paper here in New York City. Before joining the Times, he reported for the Baltimore Sun, the Washington Post, USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, and others. Jonathan is also a novelist. Number four, Imperial Lane, was such a Chautauqua Prize finalist, among other distinctions. His new book is called Semitism, Being Jewish in the Age of Trump. The Washington Post has called it a passionate call to arms, and I call its author a wonderful colleague at the New York Times. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan. So one note of housekeeping before we begin. The way that you ask questions, I heard it introduced as an extremely complicated technical situation. It's not. Um, on your cards, but also on that screen, you can submit questions live to the website, and the event code is 5894. And in a little bit, I'll uh, look at the iPad up here, and we'll be thrilled to ask all of your questions, or as many as I can get to. So, Jonathan, I thought we would start with you. Um, it seems fairly safe to say that a single tweet changed your life. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that tweet that you sent in May 2016, what the reaction was to it, and how it set you on the journey to write this book. So in May 2016, it was a time when Donald Trump was kind of marauding through the Republican primaries. There was this notion among the Republican cognoscenti that some deus ex machina was going to swoop down and keep him from the, prime, or the uh, nomination, but of course that never happened. And a uh, Washington Post columnist, Robert Kagan, who's at the Brookings Institution, uh, wrote a piece, This is How Fascism Comes to America. And as I do often, uh, I just took a snippet of it, put it on Twitter with a link, sent it out, and I got a response back that just said, Hello, Weissman. And that was it. But Weissman was in three parentheses. And I, you know, I never really thought about my name being very Jewish-ish, but in, <laughs> in, the, in that context, I kind of intuited that that had something to do with the Jewishness of my name. And I said, care to explain? And he sent it back and he said, whoa, ho, ho, the vaunted Ashkenazi intelligence, I have belled the cat for my fellow Goyim. And then this onslaught of anti-Semitic hatred just kind of started flowing to me, and it turned out that belling the cat is a literal term um, that, that there was a software out there that we didn't know about called the Coincidence Indicator that searched out Jews with the three parentheses around their names for kind of these search and destroy attacks on social media, and uh, that it did indeed change my life, I suppose. Give us a little bit of a sense of how aware or unaware you had been about First of all, about your own Jewish identity, but also about anti-Semitism in this country or beyond before you got that email. I, I grew up in Atlanta, and I grew up in a very reform synagogue and a very reform uh, household. You know, my synagogue has a, a, an electric arc, and the arc comes down and the lights go on, and there's a, there's a, a Christian uh, choir behind uh, a curtain, so it sounds even more angelic. Um, and... Uh, I really didn't. I really didn't think a lot about anti-Semitism. My uh, my Sunday school education was kind of like Jewish persecution 101. I I learned <laughs> all the ways we've been persecuted in the past. Um, but interestingly, it wasn't until I started researching this book that I found out that Leo Frank was a member of my synagogue. It's amazing to think that in my whole childhood, as I was being raised. Nobody bothered to say, oh yeah, and you know, Leo Frank was a member of this synagogue. It was like everything was swept under the rug. Um, and that's why I think this burst of anti-Semitic hatred in all its kind of newness, but also its ancientness, you know, all of the old Nazi era tropes and the Russia era tropes, they were all back there. And it was such a shock to me because I really had thought of anti-Semitism as, as somebody else's problem or certainly 
uh, not really a major issue in the United States. So in Jonathan's book, the thing that sort of the catalyzing event is this tweet and then the onslaught, and then I think you became the top five most... Uh, yeah, the, the Anti-Defamation the League actually tallied them all, and I'm sad to say I came in number five in the top yeah. ten. But Maybe next year number one. Um, but, you know, Steve, in your book, um, it's not a tweet that sort of serves as this catalyst, um, but real-life violence, probably the most famous sort of orgy of violence or pogrom in, in Jewish history. So I want you to take us back, if you can, um, to the time of the pogrom in April 1903, and I know this is asking you and <laughs> to consolidate a lot of the book, but maybe give us a little bit of a sense of um, how it shaped the political world that we now inhabit in a lot of ways. Well, let me start with this. Um, can you just, hear yeah. Me now? Oh, I just, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. I, I've, I, often when I've spoken before, I think just Jewish audiences, although I usually speak before Jewish audiences, someone, there's invariably someone who says they can't hear you before you begin to speak. And, um, but do hold so, it up higher. But you, 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 can, you can hear me now. So I, I just want to build on something that Jonathan, Jonathan had said before, everything swept under the rug, rug except for misery, which, which <laughs> is an apt summary for the way in which often the Russian Jewish past is, is, is spoken about. And, uh, and, and consequently, um, I, I never really imagined writing about pogroms, and, um, and never intended, uh, although I mean, clearly I did, um, never set out to write this, specifically the book that I ended up writing. What um, interested me um, at the outset is to understand better what actually ends up entering into history and what, is, what disappears, and mostly everything disappears. And then I became intrigued with the, the promiscuous impact of this particular event. And um, an event, uh, I mean, whereby the, the very name Kishnev before the Second World War was synonymous uh, for, for Jews um, for abject misery, um, for, for tragedy. And that's really what led me to begin digging, uh, and I dug more and more and more and be began to discover the extraordinary imprint that this particular event ended up having um, on Jews of various sorts, who many of whom could barely agree about anything else except for the importance of the Kishnev pogrom. Um, the role I discovered that it, it had in the imagination of some of the fiercest anti-Semites of modern times as a prelude, as I describe in the book, to the writing of that one anti-Semitic text that continues to have real legs, the Protocols of the Elders of, of Zion, and then also the um, way in which preoccupation with pogroms ends up intersecting um, with um, the creation of the NAACP, inspired actually right on the stage. I, I've, I've, I've never seen this stage before, and I'm a little bit awestruck by just the, just the experience of sitting on it, um, and by um, a, uh, a comment regarding intersectionality that actually happens right here, and is the work of a now forgotten but extraordinary woman, Anna Strunsky, one of the many women in history who was there and who disappears. And so, I, um, so it was really um, an attempt to un try to understand um, how it is that this particular event um, left the imprint that it did that led me on this journey, and I forget your question. Well, there are th <laughs> one, one thing that interested me is that how, how this sort of singular event could lead to such different political conclusions. So perhaps one way for you to talk about it is talk to us about Anna Stromsky, um, I believe his name is, uh, who's Jacob? Jacob Bernstein Kogan, and then also the guy who, Krishnev, who wrote the, the protocols. I think those are sort of three main threads that will give people here a sense of the main responses to this event. So, you know, as, as a historian, um, what, what has often fascinated me is just the role of contingency and, and accident in, in history. Um, 
the, the, the Kishnev, there are other far more heinous pogroms. Very soon after the Kishnev pogrom, in Odessa, probably 600 Jews are killed in the fall of 1905. And it, it, the, the tragedy doesn't leave the kind of imprint that it does. Part of the reason why Kishnev becomes Kishnev is because of where Kishnev is. It's located near the most porous border of the Russian Empire at the far southwest. And it's the easiest place to smuggle anything out of. And with um, most of the smugglers in that particular region at that particular time being Jews. And um, it happened, for, probably for that reason, to have been the seat of the so-called Correspondence Bureau of the Zionist Movement. And like almost everything else created by the Zionist Movement then, under Theodor Herzl, the Bureau sounded immeasurably more important than it was. It, um, it, it, was, it was one guy. It was one man, and uh, as I describe him in the book, an underpaid, overweight, um, good-hearted man named Jake, Jacob Bernstein uh, Kogan, who actually has an incredibly hard time making a living before and really almost never, never makes a living afterwards, but enters into history at this moment because he's established all these connections with world newspapers because of his work as the head of this correspondence bureau. And it's, um, he, he then collects money to send telegrams to the world press and he already has these contacts. He has smugglers who are able to go across the border, um, and the border is very close, only 70 miles um, to, to the west. In other words, had the same event occurred 120 miles to the east, and uh, Odessa is just about 100 miles to the east of Kishnev, it would not have been the Kishnev pogrom. But the and lesson you, for him, of course, is that Jews cannot sustain themselves without political sovereignty, that Jews cannot exist in exile, that they would just be waiting for the next pogrom, correct? But you have this great description of Bernstein Kogan running around in the middle of the night, raising money to send out these telegrams, and he's go knocking on doors in the middle of the night just to get, a, you know, a few shekels, no, what do we, kopecks? Well, um, he, yeah, he, it, he, he, um, he spends about 1,500 rubles on rubles, telegrams, I'm which sorry. is a fair, fair amount. And then, he, yeah. and then he's, he's knocking on the doors, and he is the protocol of the elder of Zion. He's the elder of Zion. Well, so so part, of, part of what's extraordinary about the story is that he actually is in gymnasium. He's in high school together with Pavel Khrushchevan, who ends up being the publisher of the first version and almost certainly the author or the co-author of the first version of the protocols. So they're both in school uniforms together. And, um, and so Khrushchevan knows Jacob Bernstein Kogan, and Bernstein Kogan later writes about Khrushchevan. And um, so, so, I mean, so, uh, uh, so the, the, the degree of, of intimacy is enormous, and also the way in which, and this is so often true in any kind of bigotry, there's just enough fact in other words, Bernstein Kogan did spread this news, and it did have the impact that it had. And it caused a worldwide hubbub for all kinds of reasons, partly because of, 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 of Hearst, the Hearst newspapers. Um, see, see if any of this uh, resembles anything in, in present day life. Hearst is then a, um, uh, this incredibly um, uh, power hungry man. He owns these newspapers. He's hoping to be elected, win the, demo, win, win, uh, the nomination for president of the United States. He's courting people in any way he possibly can. Uh, sounds familiar, and he um, and uh, and and he 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 builds. He's trying to build on on the on the tragedy of of the Kishnev pogrom, and so you have newspapers. You have the beginning of the photography of catastrophe. This is the first Jewish catastrophe that um, that actually is accompanied by photographs, and. In some ways, the very small number of Jews killed, 45 are killed, four others die of wounds, um, subsequently suffered during the pogrom. The very small number means that you could actually photograph all of them. And a, a little bit like that, um, that Syrian boy who died on the beach that galvanized American interests for about five minutes um, um, and sympathy for immigrants, the, um, the fact that you actually could photograph all of the Kishnev dead had a, an extraordinary impact. You couldn't photograph all the Odessa dead. And um, so the, the convergence of all kinds of, of factors, small and large factors, as small as, 
as the weather, almost invariably um, uh, pogroms like revolutions happen in temperate weather. And the weather was actually, it rained after the first uh, day of the pogrom. The first day is not the most violent day, the second day. And had it rained heavily on the second day, there probably wouldn't have been the pogrom. So mm. the proximity of the border, the, 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 the weather, the presence in this particular city of, a, of, of an unusually talented Jewish activist um, or a very active Jewish activist and, uh, and a clutch of particularly um, um, active anti-Semites. The convergence of these factors and, and then also um, the pogrom ends up being remembered, I think, because Jewish political parties are at their height at this moment. And so you have institutions that consolidate the memory. The Zionist movement consolidates the memory of Kishnev and sees the origins of the Haganah, later the Israeli army, as beginning with the Kishnev pogrom. The Jewish socialists consolidated. Chaim Nachman Bialik, the great poet, writes his poem about it that enters into the Jewish Palestinian, later the Israeli um, curriculum. Um, 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 uh, Zangwill writes the melting pot inspired by the Kishna pogrom. And so you, you have all of these, these artifacts and institutions that end up keeping it alive. Well, one of the things that also seems to happen in that moment, and that we see echoes of in Jonathan's book, is the fact that um, the pogrom shaped the way that we modern Jews think of anti-Semitism, meaning that it is a phenomenon of the political right. And that one of the political lessons from it seems to be that we should make alliances with the political left. And as a result, I think that it remains true that it's easier for us to talk about anti-Semitism, I think, when it comes from the political right, which is certainly, Jonathan, what your book is about. And I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit. Well, I, I mean, I actually, wherever I go, I'm asked about the, what about the, what about the uh, anti-Semitism of the left? And I, I draw distinctions between I don't know why Louis Farrakhan is up there upside down, but I draw a distinction between Louis Farrakhan's version of anti-Semitism, which is obviously just gutter bigotry. I mean, he repeats the same tropes and stereotypes and conspiracy theories that you see, um, you know, from the Richard Spencers of the world and the and the David Dukes. That's that's one thing. But I would also say that Louis Farrakhan, now such as his power ever was kind of peaked in 1995 with the Million Man March. And um, he's, I don't, I, although there are certainly members of the Nation of Islam all over the, the country, I don't fear a movement building around a Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan cannot put 100,000 fascists on the streets of Budapest. Louis Farrakhan cannot pass legislation through the Polish parliament making it illegal for Poles to be accused of having anything to do with the Holocaust. Louis Farrakhan can't seize a plurality of the, of the Italian parliament, and Louis Farrakhan will not be the runner-up to the next presidential election. So I draw a distinction between that and what people talk about being the anti-Semitism of the left, of the BDS movement, and the anti-Zionism uh, and, and, anti and anti-Israel movement. I mean, the fact of the matter is, that I have a stepdaughter, I guess you wouldn't call her, she's really, anyway, it's complicated, we're just gonna call her a stepdaughter. <laughs> she's uh, at Barnard right now, tonight, she's, there. I think Barnard is voting uh, on whether to uh, divest of all assets in, uh, in Israel, and she's supporting that movement. She is uh, very, she's bat mitzvah, confirmed, very Jewish identified, loves being Jewish, and you can go and call her an anti-Semite if you like, but she won't listen to you. It will not engage her in any way. She does not believe that she's an anti-Semite, and she is not going to have an argument with you about whether she is an anti-Semite. So is, she, is that anti-Semitism the left? Obviously, what we are seeing in France um, and Britain and France, where we just had a Holocaust survivor murdered um, and a young Jewish teenager having her face slashed, that is, that is anti-Semitic acts and hatred from the left emerging out of uh, Islamist, Islamist thought and out of uh, anti-Zionism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, and, and, and what's happening in the Labour Party in Britain, as you mentioned, is really horrifying. But I, I, I don't really think that 
the movement of white, na the swelling movement of white nationalism or just right, rightist nationalism that sweeps from the Philippines to Hungary to Warsaw to Washington is, this, is the same thing as what we are seeing on a college campuses where Jews feel uncomfortable with the BDS movement. I, I mean, just, just, just Just to build on Jonathan's comments, I, I mean, I mean, <laughs> you see, it's, 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 it's happening again. <laughs> um, you know, the, 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 the reason why there's the kind of concern that would have generated a meeting like this is, and I agree, not because of Farrakhan. And uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure if her, why Farrakhan is staring at us either. Um, it's, it's because of people like Steve Bannon in, uh, breathing close to the neck of the presidency. And that's what's frightening in this country now. But I, I think to, to speak to Barry's question before, I mean, one of the things that I discovered when I was writing my book is that so many of the beliefs that I might share as um, someone coming from a liberal left political place were consolidated in no small measure in the wake of the pogrom that I wrote about and, the, and convictions that were consolidated as a result of myths. In, in the, the notion that the Russian government was responsible for fermenting pogroms is based on a text, on proof that tumbles from the Kishinev pogrom. And it's the so-called Pleva letter that's produced by, supposedly produced by the Minister of Interior. It's this that is, constitutes the proof that Russia cannot be a place where Jews live in. It's largely because of this that there's relatively unrestricted Jewish immigration to the United States that brings so many of our ancestors here, your, many of yours, I, I suspect, and certainly mine. Um, relatively unrestricted until 1921 or 2024, at, at the very moment when the Chinese are restricted uh, from emigrating to the United States in legislation uh, passed in 1902. And, um, and the Pleva letter is a forgery. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's produced by, uh, uh, by, sin by sincere people who believe that if they actually had access to what it is that Pleva believed, this is what he would say. And so, um, now I, those convictions that, m that m those, my political convictions consolidated as a result of this forgery um, are, not, are not necessarily challenged. And so part of what I learned is the, the power of mythology, the power of, I, I don't want to call it fake news because of course the contemporary meaning of fake news is, is news I do not like, but the, um, the, the, the way in which it's just incredibly incumbent upon us to read news with incredible circumspection. Um, because all the more so, I, I've come to realize, because in many ways my own political convictions were, were shaped by, um, by false news. And, um, and I, um, I think it's, it's made me um, less skeptical of those people who call themselves believers uh, because on some level, I'm a believer too. I continue to believe things that might have been in their origin empirically untrue, but at the same time, I continue to cleave to them. And um, so, um, the, um, in many ways, that marriage, that incredibly resilient marriage um, that has produced that adage, what is it that Jews live like Episcopalians but vote like African Americans, or something akin to That's that. It. I think it was Milton Himmelfarb. Um, to some extent, that marriage, which I applaud personally, was shaped by uh, mythology, and um, and you know, and it's worth I sort get, of taking that to heart. I guess just one thing I would press on, and then we can move on to other subjects with regard to anti-Semitism from the political left. Isn't that sort of, I mean, it's, to me, it feels a little bit like a failure of imagination to say that, oh, it's just college snowflakes and, you know, it won't come to anything. I mean, think about where Steve Bannon came from. Think about where the alt-right came from. It started off as, you know, randos in Reddit forums, you know, who consolidated political power and, you know, elevated and, and sort of elevated themselves to have the ear of the president, as we just discussed. So doesn't it seem possible that the same thing could happen on the left? Well, I, I think 
look, I think the watchword of all of this is vigilance. I remember when I, I have a friend who's the, who was the dean of the law school at UCLA, and I said, I'm writing this book. How seriously should I take the BDS movement and this drift toward anti-Semitic sentiments, hatred, um, in the anti-Zionist movement? And she said, oh, you should take it seriously. She said, I mean, her, her description was, basically, there's a checklist on campuses right now. You know, you have to be pro-LGBT rights. You have to be pro-civil uh, pro rights. You have to be pro-Palestinian rights. You have to be pro-BDS. I mean, it's like, and it, you know, maybe everybody has different emphases, but there's this checklist, and, and, and there's not a whole lot of discussion about each, each component of that checklist. So look, obviously I think that we, that we should always be vigilant because you're right, you never know where the wildfire starts. Um, I, I, I always just look like I So I one thing that, Jonathan, that you go after in the book that I found interesting and I'd love for you to talk about a little is um, the fact that the organized American Jewish community, in your estimation, focuses on Israel to the exclusion of focusing on domestic issues here at home, including rising um, anti-Semitism. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit a bit about that and also the response that you've gotten to that part of the book. Yeah, I've gotten more anger about that. I mean, I, I, and I knew I would. I mean, I, I dedicated an entire chapter to what I, what I call the Israel deception, um, which is my sense that over the years, um, Jewish organizations, especially the mainline Jewish organizations with the big glass and steel uh, skyscrapers in Manhattan and Washington, um, have become inordinately obsessed with Israel. And I... I I talk about this, I talked to this guy, Ken Stern. Ken Stern was at the American Jewish Committee for more than 20 years. And when he came there, he talked about the entire floor that was dedicated to domestic issues like education and civil rights and interreligious outreach and interethnic outreach and all the and energy security. And as time went on, he talked about how each of these issues became wrapped up in Israel. And then eventually they all started atrophying away until the main focus of the American Jewish Committee was this outreach to the diplomatic community to try to maintain support for Israel in, uh, abroad. And this wasn't used, didn't used to be what the American Jewish Committee focused on. And that, that story goes on in many, many, many organizations because the fact is that the one thing that Jews could agree on is we are supposed to support the Jewish state. So it, became, it was easier to raise money that way, it was easier to not tick off one, side, one, one political side or the other. If you have large you know, Jewish donors who are Republican and Jewish donors who are Democratic, well, if you focused on Israel, you'll keep, you'll, you'll keep the organization well-funded. And look, I have gotten, I've gotten some people, I had a, a person call me up from the American Jewish Committee board and quietly say, you know, I'm really, you're actually right. And the diffidence of this organization is just really disturbing to me in this moment. And then I had, I was at, uh, gave a speech at the Stryker Center a couple of weeks ago where a former head of the American Jewish Committee bounced up and down and screamed at me for, for you know, 10 minutes. So um, uh, there has been a lot of pushback. And, and, and I've had this weird pushback that I did not, I expected that. I expected pushback from conservative Jews who said that I didn't talk enough about anti-Semitism of the left. I did talk about it. But this, I had an odd, I've had an odd pushback from uh, from liberal kind of social justice Jewish organizations who were just who were just angry that I didn't give them enough credit. Um, we're doing wonderful things, so why aren't you giving us credit? Well, I, you know, I my book is something of a wake up call, and it wasn't supposed to be a, a roster of pats in the head. So, um. um, do you have any hard questions for me? Yeah, I have lots of hard questions for you. Well, this could be a sensitive thing to discuss, but it seems to me that anti-Semitism, in a way, is a rapid route to Jewish identity and pride. I mean, I was struck by that in, in actually both of your books, um, that the, you know, it's 
we don't want to celebrate violence, but in a way it sort of catalyzes, it certainly did for you, Jonathan, and I think it served as that for a lot of the activists that you, some of the activism that you talk about in your book, and I'm wondering if you can each speak it's, to that. Like, do we need anti-Semitism to some feel ways, Jewish? In some ways it was almost, one sees almost the opposite reaction. And, and that's um, intriguing and, um, and odd. It's um, what I came to see when I, uh, as I worked on the pogrom was that the best known, most canonized uh, reaction, Jewish reaction to the pogrom is Chaim Nachman Bialik's in the city of killing. And um, so he, he spends five weeks in Kishnev uh, interviewing victims, uh, bystanders, uh, witnesses, and um, copious notes um, that are then sequestered in, in, in an archive in Beit Bialik and, um, and published only in the last, last 15, 20 years or so. And, um, and then uh, he, um, he, he's supposed to, to actually uh, publish these notes or organize these notes, and he never does. The reason why he hides them away is completely unclear. And then he goes and he writes this poem and, um, and the poem, the, 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 the center of the poem is a laceration of Jews, and specifically Jewish males, for having um, hidden uh, while their wives, their, their mothers, um, their sisters were raped. And, um, and it's this, those passages that end up inspiring the creation of Jewish self-defense groups, both Zionist and non-Zionist. Um, his poem has as much impact on Jewish socialists. In fact, it's, its greatest impact is once it's translated into Russian by Vladimir Jabotinsky, not then on the political right, but eventually on the political right. It's a, it's a poem that ends up being loved by Ben-Gurion, the first Israeli prime minister, as much as it's loved by, by Vladimir Jabotinsky, even once he turns to the right. What's, is it still taught in Israeli school? Uh, no, but it but it was until until f fairly recently, um, and it was it was it was so much part of the canon into the uh, well into the 60s. The um, and it's one of the reasons I think, and, and I think into the 70s, one of the reasons why Benjamin Netanyahu constantly reference references it. What's curious is that not only does Bialik write extensively in his notes about acts of Jewish self-defense. Uh, both organized and sporadic that occur despite the fact that Jews are massively outnumbered uh, by po pogromists. Um, uh, there are about nine, 900 pogromists who end up being arrested. But in the tri trial transcripts of the pogromists who are arrested, and there's trials that go on from the summer extending all the way well into December 1903, one of the main arguments made by their defense attorneys is that, is that, is that all they were engaged in is self-defense because they were just partying on the first day, but Jews are so militant and so overreacted that it was Jews who actually were the aggressive ones, and they consequently were, were, were acting in order to save their lives. That ends up disappearing from canonized Jewish memory. Um, and, and that is what enters into um, the memory of, of Russian anti-Semitism, that the, the pogrom was simply a, an act of, of Jewish aggression, whereby, and Jews actually don't suffer all that much, then they claim all this money for insurance, and they benefit from the pogrom. So, um, so in, 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 in some ways, the memory of the pogrom is almost um, uh, um, topsy-turvy. And, um, and quite what it is that Jews remember and their antagonists remember is, is counterintuitive. It is and interesting because when we, when we look back at the Jewish role in the civil rights movement, that's kind of like this, this halcyon days where Jews were brave and you know, there were Jewish youth down, going down to Mississippi with black youth for, to, to, uh, as freedom riders to, to register uh, African Americans to vote and uh, Jewish rabbis were linking arms with uh, African-American preachers. But when you look back further, and you kind of realize that that's not, I mean, that kind of sense of Jewish bravery is more the aberration than the rule. You know, when I talked about Leo Frank in my, in my book, and 
Leo, when Leo Frank, after Leo Frank was lynched, in New York, the Anti-Defamation League gets, la gets launched. In Atlanta, half the Jewish population left, and my synagogue banned hoopa weddings and basically became what's known as the church on Peachtree Street. Mm -hmm. um, they, I mean, it wasn't exactly a, a moment of, of great fortitude. Um, and in fact, it was really, in some ways, uh, the, the, the editor of the Atlanta Constitution, uh, Ralph McGill, who really can't, uh, um, immortalized the bombing of my synagogue by the Klan in the 50s, not really the Jewish response. Um, it's, it's worth, it's worth bearing in mind that before those brave Jewish civil rights movements and, and ended up being seen as emblems of the left, um, Israel was an emblem of the left. Uh, I.F. Stone um, uh, um, produced a, uh, a cocktail book called This is Israel. Uh, with pictures by uh, Robert Kapka, uh, uh, Akapa, the uh, the great photographer, and he um, he boasts in his um, in his memoirs about how he raised um, um, money for guns uh, for the creation of the Israeli state, and that nothing him nothing gave him greater satisfaction than the creation of the state. Um, the the creation of the Israeli state was um, applauded by the left, and um, and 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 the, and the bravery of those Jews who were fighting for its creation was very much a part of the, of, of the, of the Jewish left um, saga um, until it stopped being part of the Jewish left saga. And that, that predates um, by, uh, by decades, um, the, uh, by decade and a half, the moment that you're talking about. How did, how did the two events that sort of um, ground each of your books, the Kishnev and then the election of Trump, just big picture, how do you think that those sort of traumas, I know that they're very different moral universes, but how did those traumas shape the way that the Jews think about themselves and their place in political life? Well, I mean, it's important to know that not all Jews think of the Trump election I understand as, as a trauma. That. I understand uh, that. Uh, you, 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 you do know that. I and, do. Um, I, I know some of those people. Uh, uh, they're in right. my family. Um, there, some, some, some of those in my family are in this audience. Uh, but <laughs> yes, yeah, so you want to start? Well, I, you know, I, I talk about the, the tribalist versus the internationalist Jew. Um, and the tribalists uh, w welcome Trump because, you no, know, look, we can look, we can look past Steve Bannon, we can look, we can, we don't have to worry about Seb Gorka being in the White House even though he's a member of the hun a Hungarian anti-Semitic rightist group. Um, we can look past all that because, hey, he's going to move for the uh, embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I mean, the tribalists view everything through the prism of what is going to be good for the state of Israel and uh, empower and, and strengthen Israel. The internationalists view the rise of nationalism in, in, in so many forms as usually bad for the Jews. Um, I think Jews do better in, in eras when, the, the, when, the, uh, when borders are blurred and walls are coming down. When walls go up, pe the, people tend to start looking for the, uh, for the other in their midst. And that's, um, I think that's the era that we're in right now. Although, in a way, doesn't the existence of the Jewish nation state and Jewish nationalism guarantee our security on the Upper West Side? You know, that's what my mother would say. Um, I, I, I would say that, look, the fact of the matter is that if the United States becomes a hostile nation to Jews, I do not believe that Israel will be the safe haven that it is now. Because we are, the United States is still the largest uh, I mean, Israel is still the largest recipient of military aid. Israel's Iron Dome uh, was built with Jewish ingenuity, but with a lot of American money. Um, the, Amer the Israeli Air Force will be the only Air Force in the Middle East to fly the Joint Strike Fighter, but when the Joint Strike Fighter rolls off the assembly line, it will be in Fort Worth, Texas, not in Tel Aviv. So I do not believe that a hostile, a, an anti-Semitic, hostile America um, would guarantee the would necessarily guarantee this the uh, protection of Israel. I'm not saying that we're there. I'm not saying we're there. By the way, I'm not implying hostility. I'm just saying give give America that the existence of Israel gives diaspora Jewry a sense of political security. J J J That's J all I'm saying. Absolutely, J J Jonathan, it does. I mean, I mean, despite all that you write about in your book, Hold up the mic. Um, despite all that you write about in your book, um, 
America is not going to become overtly anti-Semitic. And um, the kinds of forces that you've encountered, which are unbelievably unpleasant, and, and I take you at your word, um, are um, they've, they've risen beyond the shadows in the wake of the last election, and that's disturbing. But to the extent to which people in the United States are truly threatened, they're not us. Okay, and, and I, um, make that point, I make that point in the book no, no, yeah, over and, I, and, and over and, and over. I know you don't disagree. And um, so I think, I think where your book is particularly instructive is that what you show us is that, um, in other words, you, we're now bruised um, somewhat by what it is that others are battered by. And um, so um, we have no more than bruises that will go away. And those bruises should alert us to what is the increasingly the daily experience of truly vulnerable people in the United States in an atmosphere like ours and perhaps the atmosphere that's going to deepen and worsen over the I years. Couldn't, I couldn't agree more, absolutely. So, so picking up on what Steve just said, there's a very good question from the audience, sort of to that theme. When I was younger, uh, this person writes, there was a strong social alliance between Jews and blacks. That link, I fear, has been lost. Can we discuss why and can it be repaired? You know, there was a, there was a, a line, it, it's really striking in Stephen's book, um, when uh, African Americans are trying to draw the linkage between Kishinev, the Kishinev program, and lynchings in the South. And um, was it B'nai B'rith? B'nai Br B'nai put out a statement saying, well, these, these, these uh, incidences aren't anywhere comparable. One, at one, 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 one local uh, leader of B'nai B'rith. Okay, one local leader of B'nai B'rith said these, these incidences aren't comparable at all, and uh, lynching is often brought on by black lawlessness. I was so struck by this. But that but, was just, I mean, what's, what's striking, and, I, and I, I wasn't aware of any of this before I started research for that last chapter of the book on the, the connections um, that were drawn between pogroms and, and lynching. So in many ways, in, in very similar ways to the way in which many with the exception of Jews and those who were liberal or on the left, described pogroms in Russia, which were largely blamed on Jews, blamed um, on Jewish uh, rapaci economic rapa rapaciousness, uh, blamed on excessive Jewish radicalism, just, just blamed on the unpleasantness of Jews. And so there was a natural reaction whereby people beat Jews on the head. The um, lynchings here were typically blamed on the behavior of African Americans. Uh, blamed either on, on, on black sexual appetite, on um, blacks um, uh, ruining the economy, competing for, for jobs, that sort of thing. The typological similarities were, were, were extraordinary and in ways not dissimilar, I think, from the way in which the Parkland tragedy, a tragedy that hit a middle class, upper middle class school um, uh, with, with, um, uh, with a lot of kids who are accustomed, who, who are telegenic, um, and able to communicate tragedy more effectively than the average child, the African-American child, who was affected daily by, by, by comparable shootings. Um, ways comparable to those Parkland um, kids, um, Anna Strunsky and, and other Jews were able to step, step forward um, even after these African-American newspapers were themselves drawing the connection between pogroms and lynchings, but had no impact beyond the black community. And, um, and, um, and, and insisted that there, there was a similarity, insisted that the kind of attention that was being given to pogroms ought to be given to lynchings in this country, and, and the first person to actually air that in a way that had impact, aired that right on this stage um, um, without ever planning to do so, but it just happened in the middle of, an, of, of some extraordinary exchange, and it was literally that night that conversation began that led to the creation of what became the NAACP. And um, so, um, so those moments uh, of, of, of Jewish black relations weren't necessarily typical then, and um, that was an exceptional moment. And, um, and I think 
um, the, the kind of the sense of affinity that so many Jews have felt for, 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 for African American causes has not dissipated. And um, the relationship was then a complicated one for all kinds of reasons, the vastly different way in which Jews came to this country as opposed to blacks, the different kind of socioeconomic condition of Jews and, and, and blacks, the different kind of cultural conditions, those, and the, and the expectation then and still in the black community, the Jews should be better. The Jews should understand more. James, um, James Baldwin writes about this brilliantly. Um, in, his, in, in, in his work, often writing essays and commentary, trying to explain to Jewish liberals, it, for, in a liberal magazine, the commentary was why it is that blacks look toward Jews and expect more and, and perhaps dislike Jews more at times than other whites. Jonathan, are there any organizations today that you would point out that are doing the kind of work that Anna Stromsky was doing then to connect um, Jewish oppression to black oppression? I mean, they're all, at, 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 at kind of root, grassroots levels, they're, those things are happening all over the place. I talked about uh, an organization in Nashville called NOAA that is bringing, that's a, a, a coalition of Jewish uh, black, uh, black churches, white churches, and a couple of Islamic organizations. I talked to a, an organization on Long Island today. Um, uh, they reached out to me, uh, who was doing this, doing doing the same thing. It was a, a, t a town in Long Island. A kid, um, a, a swastika appeared on a synagogue, and they said, "What are we going to do about this?" And they got together and started a new organization. I think these things are happening a lot at at the grassroots level in a lot of a lot of cities, but I still believe that there's a lot of <laughs> A lot more work to be doing to be done on the on the higher on, on kind of a higher level. There are a lot of questions here about Israel, so I'll just pick out one or two, and you guys can respond as you like. Um, one: Why should the belief that Israel must be singled out as the only country deserving economic boycott and human rights condemnation not be thought of as anti-Semitic? Um, another. There, there are just a lot of questions along those lines. So if someone wants to pick that up about sort of circling back to, I guess, the comments you made earlier, Jonathan, about BDS. You no, know, I, I want to think about, I think about young Jews coming of age now, um, you know, 18, 19, going to college. You know, when I was growing up, I remember Israel, um, you know, as a, as a vibrant democracy that moved from left to right to center to left to right, I think that a lot of a lot of young Jews today only remember Likud. They don't they don't remember the Oslo Accords. They certainly don't remember Camp David. They don't remember uh, you know, the assassination of Rabin. They just they only remember Likud. Um, and I'm just my feeling on this is not. I, I, I strongly feel like American Jews should be thinking about what's happening in the United States and stop obsessing about Israel. But wherever I go, people still obsess about Israel and ask me Israel questions. So I have to answer the Israel questions. And my feeling is that if you're a 19-year-old who really, really does not like Bibi Netanyahu and, 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 and that's all you know, you shouldn't have to answer to it. You, it, is, it, is, it is a problem in the, in the anti-Semitism of the left in Israel, I mean, I'm sorry, in Europe, that somehow Jews have to renounce the state of Israel to be okay in liberal circles. I don't want that to come to the United States in any way. I think that you can have a Jewish identity and a strong affinity for your, for your religion and your heritage without constantly having to answer for Israel. I really feel strong. Let, let me let me let me just um, let me just add add this. Um, BDS does not represent an existential threat to the existence of Israel. It um, it uh, is Israel. Israel is going to exist with or without BDS, um, and Jews are not going to stop obsessing about Israel. <laughs> and so uh, Jews will Jews are not going to stop obsessing about Israel. So, um, so on the, so, so on the, so on, on the, on the one hand, um, um, there will be 
an outsized preoccupation with what it is that Jews do, had there, had there not been an outsized preoccupation with, what, with the presence of Jews, we wouldn't have gotten the Balfour Declaration of 1917. The Armenians didn't get one. Jews stand out. Jews, Jews have stood out ever since the writing of the New Testament, which refers back to an Old Testament. Um, we're unusually visible, no matter how small we are numerically. Um, we benefit at times from that visibility, that excessive visibility, and we suffer at times from that excessive visibility. But live with it. The visibility is a part and parcel of Western culture, and it's not going to go away. And, um, and the creation of a Jewish state after so long is not going to be a marginal preoccupation of Jews. It simply won't be. And, um, and at the same time, uh, BDS is not going to destroy the state of Israel. And so once one, I don't know, once one establishes those as basic paradigms, what one does with them is a variety of things. There's no doubt that there's a disparity between the largely liberal politics of, of, of American Jews and at the same time the European right type politics that presently reign in Israel and are likely to do so for the foreseeable future even when and if Netanyahu falls. And that obviously is going to create some tension. At the same time, the most actively involved Jews are those who feel the most strongly about Israel. And, and my um, fear is that the, everyone else, <laughs> I mean, the young, the young people who don't feel that way are simply drifting away from Jewish identity. And they just don't want to deal with it. And that, if, you, if I think about what the real threat to Jew, American Jewry is, it is the drift away from Judaism And so, and so what, what I might say is that if one, if one takes Jewish culture seriously, Jewish culture is filled with all kinds of counterintuitive, bizarre things. Have you ever looked at the afternoon, um, the, the Musaf service um, um, in, in, uh, for, for the Sabbath? It's about sacrifices. I don't relate to that, but I say it. I don't quite know why, but I do. Okay, there's, there's I mean, the entire culture is filled with things that are utterly counterintuitive. Prayers for the for the for 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 for, for the for the for, for people to actually for team for those who are dead to actually come alive. Could you imagine? I and mean, roll. imagine overpopulation of the world if if that if that if that happens. And so every single culture that one lives in is filled with all kinds of unpleasantness, contradictions, and so these are among the um, unpleasant, and I don't disagree with you entirely, unpleasant aspects of what it is we were born into. I don't even want to begin talking about circumcision. So, um, <laughs> so, so. Thank so, God Andrew Sullivan is not in this audience, I don't think. Um, you're stuck in an elevator with a young Jew, and that person maybe is at the maybe they're number one on the ADLs list at the receiving end of anti-Semitism anti online. Maybe it's even more that, serious. That, than you know, the number one person was Ben Shapiro. Yes, you I do know, know that. that so. um, or maybe they're a Jew, a young Jew in France. You have 30 seconds in an elevator with them. How do you fight anti-Semitism? They ask you that. How do I fight anti-Semitism? What's your answer to that question? She, she, was asking, she was asking you. You, you both get it, but okay, you're going to have a harder a, time with right. 30 seconds. This is what I would say. I, I would say really quickly, if you stand up as a Jew and shout, what about anti-Semitism? People look at you and they'll think, oh, you're being parochial, you're, you're, you're feeling sorry for yourself. I think that, you, that Jews need to, te to band together with, uh, with Latinos, Muslims, African Americans, and you need to stand up against bigotry. Because if you stand up in a coalition against bigotry, it's not, it's not self-serving, it's not liberal, it's not conservative, it is standing up for something that we should all agree on. Um, and I, I think that this is about coalition building. You know, one, Steve, one, you get 30 seconds. I mean, one, uh, historians don't, don't do that. <laughs> you gotta do that, because I gotta but, wrap it up uh, soon. You know, I, I was I was not told when I got had this invitation that I would have, I would be asked questions like this. The um, 
you know, one... We're journalists. One fairly... <laughs> uh, surrounded by journalists. Um, you know, one fairly useful definition of anti-Semitism is hating Jews more than is necessary. And, um, <laughs> and um, I, I think when... I mean, there's unpleasant aspects about every culture. And um, uh, Madoff, Michael Cohen, all the Cohens who, who defend Michael Cohen. I, it's, it's like <laughs> half, 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 half the Cohens, half the Cohens in this goddamn city are, 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 on, are on, on, on the news every single night. Um, and um, it's, it's when that goes beyond the point of the rational. Once, once, in other words, a Madoff exists, but why it is that one remembers the names of none of the other Goyim who are absolutely miserable and rapacious. Um, I think it's once you actually cross that line and begin to es essentialize um, that, um, that one identifies anti-Semitism, so I'm going to identify it, but I'm not going to try to remedy it. Uh, that's your job? Yes. I would actually recommend on this subject an amazing essay that I read when I was in college that was really transformative for me called How to Fight Anti-Semitism by an Israeli, now an Israeli writer called Zev Magen. I think it exists on some obscure website online, but I'd recommend it. Last question um, before everyone here, I hope, buys both of these two amazing books and they get signed in the lobby, is how did writing each of these books change you um, Jewishly or, or otherwise, but I'm particularly interested in Jewishly. I, I, I used to joke that after, after I got a lot of attention for tweeting out all the anti-Semitism that was coming at me and then quitting Twitter and then rejoining Twitter and everything, <laughs> and everyone, and I would get, people would call me up and interview me and I'd say, oh my God, I cannot believe that I've become the spokesman for the Jews. Like, me? I'm the spokesman for the Jews? Um, it was it, it was it was funny to me, um, but the fact is that I had this moment. I had this moment where I was trying to decide. I was writing about I was, one chapter of my book is hide or stand up. Basically, how do you confront the the alt right? Um, is if, if all they want is attention, is the best thing to do just ignore them or uh, to fight in some ways? And I. And I remember talking to one rabbi who told me, I think we should just ignore him. I talked to the rabbi um, in Whitefish, Montana. That's a long story, but you know, her, she had a very complicated way to, well, we should do this or that and this. And then I talked to this other rabbi and he said, well, if you look at the Torah, it says, where the Jew sees injustice, the Jew is supposed to stand up against injustice. And I was, it was an embarrassing moment for me because the thought, it never had occurred to me to actually think about my religion and look to my religion for answers. Um, and I, and it was, but it was, an, it was an embarrassing moment, but a, but a very important moment for me because I've now, I started thinking about Judaism as a religion and not as an identity and not as a political persuasion. And I think that that, I think that that's the most important thing that happened in the, the whole process of writing this book. Would you say you become more religious? Yes, I would say I'm more. Uh, yes, I would say I'm more religious. I'm certainly more um, spiritual. I'd say. Um, I don't. I don't know to what extent it changed me as a as a Jew. Jewish things have always been central to what I've thought about. But I think it changed me as a writer. I um, I wanted to take very seriously the, the opportunity to write something that lost none of its subtlety, but at the same time spoke widely. And I started practicing this, frankly, in the classroom, where uh, though I teach very bright students, we don't draw from the same cultural arsenal. Uh, I don't know theirs, by and large. They don't know mine. I don't mention Barbara Streisand in class because <laughs> that, would be, that would be actually referring to an artifact from the Middle Ages. So, um, so um, and I, I don't say that to disparage them because I, I, I don't recognize their cultural icons either. We, we live in, in profoundly bifurcated worlds, and yet they come to study with me. And so first, I started practicing in the classroom and recognizing that the distinction between what we call speech and what we call writing ought to be collapsed. And I wanted to write a book 
where every sentence spoke to students like those in my classroom and then spoke to historians and um, didn't lose any of the complexity of history, which I think at its best is like the complexity of, of a novel. And you're trying to enter into rooms, you're entering into life, into um, moments that you haven't experienced. Um, but, um, and historians, if you're, you do your work well, have to employ a fair amount of imagination, though we can't make anything up. And at the same time, we have to choose mostly what not to include. So I think um, it was more the process of writing and writing and cutting more and more and more. Uh, Lucy Davidowitz once said to me when I was a graduate student, she said, you don't have to write everything you know. And, um, and, and that was a very helpful uh, message. And so um, I, I found myself just cutting things that really the reader didn't have to know and, um, and trying to figure out how to write for um, that common reader that Virginia Woolf talks about that isn't all that elusive today. There's incredible literature being produced. It just takes all the more effort to try to communicate across generations and to, to sort of traduce this kind of binary world that we live in. So I think to the extent to which it changed me, it changed me at that level. Thank you both of you so much. Um, I, I really, um, while I let them go out to the lobby, uh, while they'll be waiting to sign books, I want to uh, just say two things. One is that these books really, really speak to each other, and I suggest you get both. Um, and they'll be in the lobby to take your questions um, and sign the books. Um, a few thank yous. Uh, thank you to Cooper Union, especially Professor Atina Grossman. Thank you to uh, Norton Livewright and St. Martin's Press. Um, thank you to the Jewish Book Council and the Evo Institute for Jewish Research. Thank you to Steve and to Jonathan. Um, thank you, Brett, who organized, helped organize this whole event. Thank you to Suzanne and Elliot Balaban, the literary publicists and agents extraordinaire. And to thank you to all of you for coming out and uh, having this conversation tonight. They'll be in the lobby.